welcome back to one-on-one -on -one shadow boxing. Sam, we will continue our discussion. Sure. And I think we should go back to the question of democracy. Describe me how the Socialist Alliance of Australia see democracy and how could you describe democracy? Sure. The sort of Australia we would like to see is one where there's a, really ex a real extension of democracy. And by that, we mean a number of things. Firstly, we think we need much more of a participatory democracy rather than just a representative democracy that we have in Australia. So at the moment, for instance, those decision makers that we do elect, we elect once every three or four years, uh, and we essentially have no say in the process between, between now and, 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 and then. Whereas what we would like to see is more participatory democracy. So that, what that's way? So how can you have that? There's, What's there's, the vision? The vision, for instance, is that elected officials should be recallable, should be accountable and recallable to the people that they elect. Furthermore, important decision-making processes can be subject to participatory mechanisms. And an example of that, for instance, is the, the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where they, they implemented a participatory budget, budget process where huge numbers of citizens were drawn in to voicing their views and crafting and eventually voting on that city's budget. So we think that sort of approach of real involvement needs to be extended to all, to, to all our de, uh, decision-making processes. So how do you want to achieve that, the real involvement of the people? Sure, look, I think probably the best way to start is to look at some contemporary examples from overseas. So, so for instance, in, 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 in Switzerland, yes. uh, citizen-initiated referenda are quite common. So if, if, if you get enough signatures on a proposal for, for a referendum, then constitutionally that has to be put in Switzerland. And a, and a fascinating example is, is, the, is, is the case of the referendum that was passed in Switzerland that requires freight transporters transporting freight, say, from northern Italy to Germany or vice versa, to use rail freight. You know, there was, there was, there was, so, there was so much anger uh, in, in, in the Swiss population about the pollution, the noise, the loss of amenity, the, the road traffic trauma caused by these inter-European uh, freight traffic crossing, crisscrossing their borders, that they actually got it inserted into the Swiss constitution that that, that sort of freight crossing Switzerland has to go onto rail. I mean, that's extraordinary. Imagine if we could do something like that in Australia. An example of another kind, of, another mechanism is, is the one they implemented in Venezuela, where if you get 20% of the population signing a petition calling for a recall referendum for the president, you can do that. Now, wouldn't or it be for the prime minister? That's or right. For Ima imagine if we had the same thing in Australia. Imagine, for instance, our uh, elected representative to the state or federal parliament had got elected on a, on a particular platform. Once they got into parliament, they completely junked, ignored it, junk junk their promise, uh, and that's all, all yes. too common thing. Well, in that situation, uh, imagine if 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 if. If, if our citizens could do the same thing. But also in the United States, you got participating democracy in a few of the states. We, it, that's interesting, you know, because we tend to think of the United States as being um, the, the place where big money stifles democracy the most. But it's interesting that in, in the traditions of the United States and, and, and their constitution and, and, and their, their you know, struggle over 200 years ago for independence from the British, that in, in that tradition, there's some good things that we can learn from, and in, in a number Very of... Very few. Uh, OK, but, but, but some, <laughs> but some nonetheless. And the, the fact that in a number of states of the United States, um, certain um, le of. leading officials, yes. you know, like um, police chief and education boards and these sorts of things are elected as well. And I think that's a good thing. And, it, of course, the challenge for us is, try to, is, is, is to try and get is try to get people to imagine that in the Australian context. And if I can give you a concrete example, in the recent state election, uh, one of our demands was that the board of the Fremantle Port Authority should have elected workplace and community representatives on it. Because the Fremantle Port Authority is a state-owned instrumentality. So in theory, you and I own the Port Authority. Um, but it's got a board uh, appointed by by the Barnett government, and needless to say, the import appointees who we're paying the wages for that, to work right. for us as well. And and, and of course, the, you know, the appointees to the board are all drawn from the corporate world. So, if it's if, if it's an entity that's supposed to serve us, the people of Western Australia, shouldn't that organisation have elected community and workplace representatives on the board? 
Uh, and I, I think if you break it down to concrete examples like that, it makes it easier for people to imagine extending democracy uh, in the way that I've described. But that's imaginary, as you say, people may imagine. But I think if you're waiting, all the socialist alliance waiting and sitting and think people should imagine things without focusing the effort to to introduce things for the mm. people, to educate them, to 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 convince them about what democracy is, because this country is mm. by the education system, by the universities, by the politicians, by the parliament, all say this is democracy, guys. This sure. is the best ever invented. So you, you're far from the point oh, look, of we're, breaking we're, down this. We're far from the point, but, but we're also involved in other initiatives that try to convey that to people. And uh, an exciting example that, um, that some of our members over in Victoria are involved in is, is the Eureka's Futures Cooperative. And what that is, is that's uh, a, a cooperative enterprise which is being established in the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, which is the heart of Victorian dirty brown coal electricity production. And what Eureka's Futures is doing is establishing a solar hot water manufacturing facility in the Latrobe Valley. That not will, in China. Not in China, but, but it's creating manufacturing Surprising. jobs in Australia. And it's, but it's an enterprise that is 100% worker and community owned. So and, so, and everybody involved in that enterprise has one vote. Uh, so it's not the person who's invested the most capital in, in it, but everyone has one vote. And in the constitution of that cooperative, they are required to return a portion of their revenues to the community within which they're based. And I'm hoping a similar vision will be able to take off in my stomping ground in Fremantle. Uh, you may be aware that there's the old South Fremantle tip site, which is, yes. you know, it's a toxic site. It can't be developed for any other purpose. And there's been a bit of discussion about the possibility of establishing a solar farm on that site, effectively yes, turning, turning a negative into a positive um, and using a polluted site as a place of generation of, of clean, renewable electricity. But that's, that and, was and represented that by, in the state election by the Greens in Fremantle, and they did not win the seat in Fremantle. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, that, that's where, um, I mean, obviously, the state election and the seat of Fremantle had its own uh, particularities, but that is... I guess that is, that is a, a, an area where we in Socialist Alliance are different from the Greens. On, on many immediate policy issues, we agree with the Greens and, and work very closely with them. Um, but the, to the extent that they really talk about it, the Greens sort of imagine that it's possible to create a, a, a green capitalism, that somehow capitalism can go green. <laughs> and, and, and we, we, we think it's, I mean, it's the, the, the competitive nature of capitalism, uh, the thirst for profits, and as a consequence of that thirst for profits, the, the, the need of big business to always externalise the true cost of its production onto the environment and onto the community mean that that's just not possible. And I mean, I'm, I'm coming back to a theme that I talked about before in, in that we think you need to, you need to ex be able to extend democracy to key strategic sectors of the economy. And that doesn't mean we have some sort of Soviet vision for bringing the entire economy un uh, under state ownership and control. Um, you can imagine what the coffee would taste like and what the service would be like if all the coffee shops in Fremantle were run by the Ministry for Cafes. Um, no, this, this would it, be interesting. <laughs> it would be very. Uh, I, uh, it'd be worse than interesting. Um, so clearly, you know, it, it's self-evident there's a place for market mechanisms and all that kind of thing. But in key sectors of the economy that are already monopolised, they're not free enterprise. They're monopolised sectors of the economy number one, and number two, they're strategic sectors of the economy. Things like electricity generation and distribution, oh, that's water, really, those sorts that, of things. Unless those things are, I mean, it's absurd that those things were ever privatised in the first place, and you can't meaningfully have a democracy unless those things are publicly owned. So I guess, so I, 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 I guess that, you know, that's the kind of difference that we have with the Greens on that, is that, is that you, need to, you, you do need to extend that democracy into the economy. But what, we, what, what I was sort of talking about before is, if, if we can get some successful examples of that happening, um, then that starts to point people the way forward. You know, obviously, there's, there, there's little micro examples you can use. You can use examples of what people have done overseas. They, they are tools to help people imagine what might, might be possible. But we have to create a vision for a different kind of future, a different kind of world here in Australia, in Australian language, in the Australian reality, in the Australian imagination. Yes, I heard that, but you see, uh, the British started really uh, 
wrecking the whole economy in Britain and privatized anything and everything by Margaret Thatcher. So uh, all these people living here following the British homeland examples, they have not foggiest idea what else they can do because in Britain that was very successfully destroyed and people well, suffering still because of that. Now you, but still not yeah. recognition is happening in here yeah. because our Columbanets run government yeah. also would like to privatize everything and anything what sure. is possible and they just don't see your point whatsoever. Mm. I think there's, um, there's no question that we are living we are living the legacy of Thatcherism, there's no doubt about that. And before she died, um, Margaret Thatcher was asked what she regarded as her greatest, one of her greatest legacies. And she said, new labour. And, and, that, and that reflects the fact that um, the Labour Party, both in Britain and in Australia, essentially fell in behind her agenda. Now, her, and, and her agenda, ironically, was actually introduced by a Labor government in this country, the Hawke and Keating governments in the, in the, in the 1980s and early 90s. And the, the, the process of austerity and, and, and cutbacks and so-called restructuring of the economy in the labour market was done very brutally, you know, with the, um, with the baseball bat um, by Thatcher in Britain, whereas in Australia it was done what we call the sort of salami Technique, little bit at a time, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, and, and that was not the Liberals, and, and that was done by Labor. Not the Liberals, it was done, but it was done the... by Labor government. And I mean, one of our election slogans, which people sort of, well, some people anyway, recoil in horror from because they just think it's too out there, too crazy, too radical, is is we say in addition to the mining sector needing to be brought into public ownership, we also say the banking sector needs to be into, brought into public ownership. And people, you know, some people think we're we're crazy radicals by proposing that. And you need to remind people that it was actually a Labor government in the 1940s that, that first proposed bringing the banking sector in, into public ownership. And it, it, it's, it's a sign of how far politics has and moved it's to the right and in it's this happened, country. And it's uh -huh. happened in, in Australia. Yeah. That was the common world bank mm. until the other Labour's are decided to give it to the mums and dads of Australia as shareholders, mm. so privatising it. Well, and the problem we have too is that um, when in opposition, Labor will criticise the worst excesses of the Conservatives, but once they get in, they never reverse them. So for instance, when, when John Howard brought in the, um, brought in the GST, um, Labor protested against it, but, but once they got into government, they didn't remove it. But no one in the process asked the people's opinion on the GST or any other laws the government used to introduce. The state government is that, mm. or the federal government. On that note, Sam, I have to say goodbye to you and uh, wish you good luck for the very long, long way of fight, what you got in your hand. And uh, I have to say to the audience, please come back next week same channel, same time. One-on-one -on -one shadow boxing.